so yeah, I'm um, the educational director at the Radix Ecological Sustainability Center, which is a nonprofit organization based in Albany, New York. For those of you not from the area, Albany is, a, I don't know, just a couple of miles south of Troy um, on the, the western side of the Hudson River. Um, Radix, R-A-D-I-X, which is the, the Latin word for root. So, um, you know, what we mean by that, it's um, both literal and metaphorical. Literal in the sense that a lot of the work that we do has to do with plants and particularly, you know, partnering with plants as agents of regeneration and restoration, particularly in damaged, degraded, rural urban environments, but also, you know, as a metaphor, really just trying to um, address a lot of issues of unsustainability and injustice and inequity at their root level, trying to trying to get to the heart of it um, and uh, treating it less as, as applying fewer band-aid solutions to these issues, but trying to really engage with them in all their, their full complexity. So yeah, we're a um, nonprofit organization building a demonstration site of sustainable tools and technologies designed to teach urban residents how to have greater local access and control over essential resources like food, water, waste management, energy production, with an emphasis on building systems that are simple and affordable, the goal of coming up with a model that can be transferred to cities throughout the country and the world. As we know, more than 50% of the world's population is currently living in urban environments for the first time in history. What does this mean? We don't know. Perhaps there's good things about it. Perhaps there's not so good things about it. But what we do know is if we're going to make a rapid and urgent transition into a more societal, sorry, more sustainable, more equitable, more just, more regenerative society, it's really important that we look at our urban environments and think about how they can be redesigned so they're capable of providing their residents with more of their material needs in terms of food, water, waste management, energy production, at the same time, really promoting greater um, equity and fairness all at once. So yeah, focusing a lot on uh, bringing in kids in school groups, uh, teaching ecological literacy, which is about having greater familiarity with how to do things like grow food, how to collect rainwater, how to produce compost, what it means to have a relationship with the non-human, things that you know many times as a consequence of living in a city you may be disconnected from. And you know, Albany, like Troy, is a small city. You don't have to go very far to be outside of it. I mean, we really can just cross the Hudson to the east and be in fields and farms and forests. But if you don't have a car, those things aren't going to be accessible to you necessarily, nor are you necessarily going to be culturally comfortable going into those predominantly white spaces and often heavily conservative as well. So we think there's a lot of value to integrating green space, ecological space, agricultural space into a high density urban mosaic where people can engage with it on a regular basis where kids can come uh, every day and see how these systems transform and change over time and can develop that, that type of deep familiarity and learning that comes in. So programs with elementary schools that are within honestly walking distance to us, there's, there's two of them, Toast Elementary and Given Elementary, which um, removes the, the barrier of transportation costs, which is pretty substantial otherwise. Um, we've actually just gotten a contract as of this week with the Albany School District to now do garden-based learning educational programs in every elementary school in the district, uh, which we're, we're really excited about. We're not really even sure what exactly what this means. But um, yeah, I mean, ideally we would have something like a Radix or a Sanctuary integrated into every school campus where um, kids could really be engaging on, on such a deeper level. And to really try and work, you know, there's a lot of enthusiasm for STEM right now, science, technology, engineering, and math. And, you know, that, that is what it is. Um, I, I'm, I, I, you know, critique of what it leaves out, what is excluded from it, particularly the arts, uh, particularly the humanities. But, um, you know, as a starting point, we'll say to teachers, okay, bring him to an environment like a garden where we can see the synthesis of chemistry and physics and biology and ecology. And then we'll add on layers of politics and social sciences, arts and history, and work backwards from there. Let kids become familiar with the endpoint application of it all. 
as a starting point, sort of what we might, in, in, in pedagogical theory, refer to as backwards design, a form of that. So um, yeah, work with elementary school kids. We do uh, work with high school students uh, after school yeah, employment program where high school students are coming five days a week from four to seven, working on at the Radic Center, helping with all the various systems there, including uh, the gardens, honeybees, chickens, renewable energy systems, composting, rainwater collection systems, uh, while also learning about environmental justice issues in the local community. So really combining kind of uh, practical skills with, uh, with, with a broader, broader theoretical approach. That turns into a, a big five-week summer youth employment program that we do that's funded through the city summer youth employment program, similar to uh, Uptown Summer in, in, uh, that the sanctuary does. And we combine that with uh, actually an AmeriCorps program that with college age students and we have the two working together. The past two summers, we've done something called Pandemic Resilience of Climate Justice, which, um, you know, puts high school students and, and college age students together as a team, going out, you know, working in gardens, doing a lot of food delivery, doing just a lot of pandemic relief, really. And that's been one thing about the pandemic is our work it normally is, is sort of a balance between education and and, and, and food sovereignty building, food, food, food justice, food access relief. Um, and during the pandemic, there's really been more of a shift towards doing food relief just because the demand has been so high locally. And a lot of educational programs just either went online entirely or have disappeared. So it's, so it's, it's a real joy that the educational piece is, is coming back. And it's so great to have students once again be coming in person to, <clears throat> Sorry, two Radix, and to be able to offer these two community events once again. So more broadly, partnering with uh, neighborhood uh, organizations and doing a lot of environmental justice advocacy, working with the uh, A Village Inc., with the Trinity Institute, other community-based organizations, uh, doing a lot of work and organizing around uh, Ezra Penis Homes in the south end of Albany, where we've been organizing with citizens to do traffic counts documenting the fact that there you know, are a thousand plus diesel trucks and buses a day going by that are contributing to residents having asthma rates approaching 30 and 40 percent and um, drawing attention to these environmental justice issues, which often tend to get swept under the rug, particularly in mainstream sustainability discourse, which um, focuses less on issues of equity and access. So that's about what I'm going to get to here in a minute, just really quickly, though. This is sort of the main centerpiece of our uh, center is uh, this photo right here. This is actually a couple years ago. It's, it's changed quite a bit since then, but we have a 20 foot by 60 foot solar greenhouse that contains, among other systems, um, aquaponics and uh, rainwater collection systems. And again, by just maintaining uh, a warm growing environment, uh, we're able to extend educational programs throughout the year. Uh, kids can come here in December and January when there's otherwise uh, minimal opportunity to learn about living systems and be able to be engaged with it. I mean, it just happens at this climate that our, our school year is more or less the inverse of the growing season. So we do what we can to, to extend that and um, make it available to a greater number of people. So um, yeah, I've just um, had a, a, a book come out. Um, this is actually my second book. I wrote another book in 2008 called Toolbox for Sustainable City Living. That was, um, you know, published with South End Press, which which no longer exists. It was very much like a DIY sustainability book. Um, how, how to you know, build gardens, how to build aquaponic systems, how to set up rainwater collection systems, very practically oriented. And, um, you know, I sort of got to the point with that where I guess I felt like, well, what's next? What's the next level out? What would it mean to engage with the urban environment on on kind of a level beyond just the backyard. What would it mean to have a regenerative relationship with the soils, the air, the water in a city more broadly? Um, I mean, to sort of borrow a concept that's used in permaculture, they just talk often about the, the zone systems. You know, to to think of like almost like zone five urban permaculture, like what's what's kind of in the the, the furthest layer out. Um, and that sort of, you know, took me down a path research-wise that I've been on for the past 10 years. Um, you know, I, I started writing a second book for a trade publisher that um, was ultimately, the manuscript was rejected because it was considered too heady, uh, not actionable enough. Um, 
And um, so I said, well, what am I going to do with that? Well, let's turn it into a PhD dissertation research, which um, is, is what I did um, in my program at RPI in the Science and Technology Studies program. And um, then, um, you know, published the dissertation. Not many, too many people read dissertations. So I um, really wanted to give these ideas um, another chance. So um, yeah, spent a good period of time after that trying to, to find a publisher, uh, somebody willing to, to take on this book. And um, yes, found that, you know, from 2008 to uh, the present, the publishing industry has really changed enormously. It's just um, a lot of those small scale independent presses have disappeared. And those presses that still exist are uh, far less likely willing to take a chance with a book that's not a guaranteed bestseller. So sort of as a last ditch attempt, I, um, I pitched it to uh, Routledge in their um, Equity, Justice and the Sustainable Cities series, which is edited by Julian Aggieman, who's a big academic hero of mine. And um, yeah, accepted it. So sort of rewrote my dissertation in a more conversational tone. And um, it's just come out. If anybody's interested in review copies, um, please shoot me an email, which I'll share with you all at the end. But um, yeah, I just wanted to talk about sort of the ideas in that and be relating it to the work that we're doing here at Radix as well, which is which is essentially what, what the book does. And it's sort of a, for, a very experimental form of academic writing because it still has a very practical hands-on element. I actually include sort of like DIY lists and how-tos, which is not typically seen in academic publication. So, um, you know, it's, it's really sort of targeted at, I guess, a, a group of people I consider sort of the activist scholar, which are people who are, um, you know, engaged in grassroots community-based work yet, who still are thinking on, on, on kind of like a higher theoretical level and to engage with that, that body of knowledge and be really pushing the boundaries of what we're comfortable with and what we understand, yet at the same time, really focus on translation, right? Because I mean, it's one thing to, to have this body of knowledge, but unless we're like, actually transferring this into action and, and making it available to people on the ground, then then what's the point of it? So um, it's in that regard unusual and, you know, we'll see how it does. I'm not expecting to really sell any copies at all, but I really just want the ideas to get out there and um, to create dialogue and engagement around them. So anyway, sustainability, right? A word that gets thrown around all the time um, is originally about being mindful of the environmental, social, and economic dimensions of life. I mean, that's honestly pretty limited. I'm not going to delve into that right now. But, you know, what's what's happened over the past couple of years, I mean, I mean I've been really engaged in, in the field of sustainability professionally for about 20 years. Prior to being at Radix in Albany, I was in Austin, Texas for about 10 years, running an organization called uh, the Rising Collective that, that was pretty similar. Um, do, uh, running a, a center for community organizing, we provided low rent space to food up bombs and book, books for prisoners projects and independent media all at the same time, you know, had a big asphalt parking lot between uh, warehouses that we ripped up and turned into gardens and uh, sustainability demonstration sites. Um, in this time, you know, I've, I've really noticed how the, the social pillar of sustainability has been decentered and there has been a far greater emphasis put on the economic and um, techno environmental aspects of sustainability. And I, I see this all the time. And um, I'm also the, the chair of urban agriculture in the city of Albany sustainability advisory committee. So I meet monthly with the heads of various municipal departments, including general services and traffic and water and engineering. And, and I'm, I'm privy to the way that sustainability is discussed in those, those techno managerial circles and it, there's considerations of of equity and fairness and justice and race and class are are just are really never discussed i mean they're honestly because they're inconvenient they would require too much of a restructuring of the current system so it's instead there there is a preference to just talk about these um as uh, aspects of sustainability that contribute to to improve to create infrastructure really you know a lot of led street lights and um and electric vehicles, which is all important stuff, right? Not to say we shouldn't have those things, but um, it's it's ultimately really only benefiting a handful of the wealthiest residents of, of the city. So this, I think this trend has just continued. Um, you know, perhaps we're seeing a little bit of reversal of it as there's, there's this you know, growing racial reckoning occurring in this country. However, 
it's to be seen if it's anything more than just checkbox diversity. Um, but, um, you know, looking at frameworks to try and reconcile this, um, Julian Agumon, who I mentioned earlier, is um, you know, sort of come up with this concept of, of what's called just sustainabilities, which is really, you know, looking for leadership from the environmental justice movement, which has done a fantastic job of identifying patterns of disparity, how it is frequently communities of color and low-income communities that suffer a disproportionate burden of exposure to environmental toxins and risks. Um, and just sustainability is uh, sort of is advocating in addition to that, that things like community gardens and public transportation and renewable energy and, and street trees should be available to all of a city's residents, not just the wealthiest ones. And really, really being proactive in that regard, right? Advocating for not just equitable distribution of environmental risks, but of amenities as well. Um, so the book then, that's sort of the overall uh, context in which the book is, is situated. Um, However, you know, what I do is sort of identify two problems um, that I see as being persistent, at least within fields of environmental education or within uh, urban sustainability, which is the fact that this a uh, this marginalization of the social pillar of sustainability. And the second is what I refer to as ecological alienation or um, ecological estrangement, I, the fact that many um, urban, particularly urban youth, have a lot of internalized negative attitudes towards the environment that is around them that really is perpetuated by a lot of mainstream environmental education pedagogy, which very much teaches that, <clears throat> sorry, pure nature is, is out there. And when I mean out there, I mean the Catskills, the Adirondacks, places not in the city, and that urban ecosystems are not interesting and degraded and inherently impure and therefore not worthy of, of legitimate study. Um, so I wanted to sort of pick apart these two different trends and see if this idea of urban ecosystem justice is, would be a framework to, to reconcile them. So this ecological alienation has its roots in what we might call nature society dualism, which could extend all the way back to sort of dark, uh, Cartesian self other dualism. And this is this is really exemplified, you know, if, if any of you've ever been to Albany before, if you visit the Empire Plaza, which is, um, um, captures uh, the, the, the spirit of, of, of nature society dualism in itself. I mean, the, it has a style of architecture that's referred to as totalitarian brutalism, which um, to me is, is meant to exemplify the complete mastery of, of, of humans over the non-human world. Um, I mean, the, even just the construction of the Empire Plaza itself resulted in one of the highest per capita displacements of residents um, resulting from an urban renewal project in the 1960s and 70s, which was when the height of these were going on. Um, other cities, I mean, I think Troy actually might have fared a lot better than Albany in that it escaped a lot of the worst of this, but the um, the, the consequences, the repercussions of the construction of the plaza, both ecologically, socially, economically, have been ongoing since um, and have been nothing short of devastating for the city of Albany. Um, but, um, you know, another useful concept for thinking about urban ecosystems is um, this concept of urban metabolism, which I use a lot in the book, which, you know, let's take a step back, right? And the fact that even the idea of, of cities as ecosystems as a, is a somewhat radical idea that, um, you know, if we define an ecosystem as being a community of organisms interacting with the, with the living and non-living aspects of their environment, cities completely uh, meet that definition, even though many people may not regard them as that. They may think of them as being complete artifice, completely human created spaces. But um, no, they most certainly are. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are functioning or healthy ecosystems, but once we identify them as such, we can ask the question of how they may be improved. Um, so, you know, the way cities function right now is very much as what we call linear ecosystems, where we have energy, food, water, goods, 
going in and pretty much being spit out the other end is uh, emissions, organic waste, wastewater, inorganic waste. What we really want to try and do, and I'm sorry, and this is typified, um, if you've ever come into Albany as well, uh, you can see the proverbial bomb trains that um, often line up for miles going into the port of Albany that until recently were um, carrying highly explosive back and crude originating from the tar sands of Canada and from um, oil fields in, in North Dakota, um, which, um, you know, there's ever present danger of uh, explosive derailment, let alone um, exposure to the chronic emissions from these, these train cars. They are supposedly now carrying more ethanol. However, you know, that could change at any given moment. Um, what we want to do is try and close this loop a little bit on the urban metabolism where cities are producing more of their resources internally, right? Um, and I, I guess I want to point off the bat, right? I don't think it's necessary really for cities to be growing 100% of their food for all of their residents. Um, we're always going to want to maintain a close relationship with farms and farmers in the peri-urban sphere, which is the, the uh, fields and forests that are right on the outside of the city. We don't want to exclude that, but it, you know, it's sort of part of a necessary process of relocalization uh, as, as a way to reduce food miles and to push back against climate change. A, a relocalization of the food supply will mean um, a greater percentage of food being grown within city limits themselves. I think 20% I think is a good mark. I think that's a highly achievable, um, if, if not higher. Um, also really important to point out, though, that um, when we're advocating for the equitable distribution of environmental amenities, it needs to be done in such a way where it doesn't trigger a subsequent ecological gentrification, which is always an ever-present risk, particularly in certain cities are more predisposed than others to this risk, uh, for certain. Uh, I mean, presently in Albany, it, we have far more of the opposite problem, which is historic disinvestment resulting from redlining. Um, that could, of course, flip at any given time and is something that we do want to be mindful of. I think one advantage of being in sort of second tier cities such as this is that we can be simultaneously advocating for green space, urban agriculture, and affordable housing at once, that there's enough of both. Um, and really ultimately towards the goal of trying to establish land trusts and take property off the market, really being led by the philosophy of, of, of cities for people, not for profit. And the right to the city movement, right? That cities are places primarily where people live their lives and build community and that, that they shouldn't be treated as uh, just tradable stock or investment schemes for the wealthy. So um, also that there are limits to how much we close the loop on a city because we don't want to fall into the trap of what's called urban ecological securitization, which uh, Dubai is, is sort of a good example of that where you have these premium environmental services for the extreme wealthy while the urban poor get pushed to the brunt of the city where they're exposed to uh, environmental risks and harm of all sorts or another. So, you know, a, again, a, a just sustainability framework that is mindful of the potential for gentrification and displacement should be able to, um, should be centered so to, to avoid falling into this particular pitfall. Um, and I mentioned this a little bit, right? But that a lot of urban studies are really focused on what are called star cities, large metropolitan areas, you know, New York City, Boston, Montreal, Austin, Atlanta, San Francisco, Seattle, the really fast growing cities. But there's a very large and interesting body of research about second tier or what are called shrinking cities with a stable or negative population growth, which um, actually a huge number of the cities that a lot of the proverbial Rust Belt towns in America, like Albany, Troy, Schenectady, Utica, Syracuse, Buffalo, um, Youngstown, going out west from there, uh, fall into this pattern and that there is opportunity in contraction and a lot of interesting research around the idea of smart and equitable decline. Uh, a lot of times we're, we're most urban planners are growth fetishists. They think that unless a city is constantly growing that there's something wrong. But cities go th through periods of growth and, and contraction. And the challenge is how to sort of manage the contraction of the city uh, and, and not have it result in, in um, basically the triaging of neighborhoods where particular neighborhoods get cut off from essential resources. So just to put that out there to you as well. Um, keeping mind on the time, I wanna go through. So, so from there, you know, identify these two main challenges in the book, uh, ecological alienation and um, 
uh, the marginalization of social sustainability. And then the chapters proceed, um, each one dedicated to a different sphere of the urban ecosystem, including water, soil, uh, composting, air, and um, biocultural diversity. So I'm gonna sort of quickly go through a couple of these and talk about how an urban ecosystem justice analysis could be applied to these particular spheres. So the first one um, is water, um, which, um, you know, one way I like to frame these conversations is around combined sewage overflows, which is a problem that a lot of cities are in the Northeast, the Midwest, even some on the West Coast have, where we have a single set of pipes on the ground that handles stormwater and sewage simultaneously. And, you know, this um, operates as it does. They go to uh, centralized treatment facilities where they're subject to energy and chemically intensive processes, but that water is ultimately returned to the river. But what occurs when we have extreme rainfall events, which if any of you are paying attention, this whole summer was, past summer was pretty much nothing but an extreme rainfall event. Um, increasingly going to happen as the climate warms because a, a warmer atmosphere has greater potential to store moisture. Um, and even just this past summer, uh, you know, seeing five, six uh, inches of rain falling within an hour and people literally drowning in their basements in Queens. Um, this is uh, sort of unfortunately a, a, a mark of, of what is to come. So um, a lot of ways that this affects us, particularly those of us doing regenerative and equi um, equity-based work in urban environments. Um, the solution to combined sewage overflows would be to put two sets of pipes on the ground um, to handle those streams separately. Of course, this is just astronomically expensive and no plan about how to do this. So you know what can be done in the short term? Um, a really important part of this is removing impervious covers, meaning materials that don't permit water to pass through. So asphalt, concrete, uh, rubber rooftops, which are um, make up a huge percentage of, of the watershed of the urban environment. Um, one of the most joyful things I've ever participated in is to just remove asphalt or concrete and to let uh, the ground beneath soak up the water. This is actually a, a project I was involved with in Stavanger, Norway, a number of years ago, where we were depaving an area. And when you can allow that water to soak back up into the ground, it's really reducing what's called the flashiness of the urban watershed and giving that chance, that water a chance to filter through the earth and, and be purified. Um, rainwater harvesting is actually another fantastic thing to do to be capturing the water off of impermeable rooftops and then storing that and using that for, for watering your vegetables, for watering your plants. Um, one of the most exciting aspects, um, or, so, or sort of assuming that CSOs are going to continue to happen into the near future, at least, um, what can be done about it after the fact? And one of the most exciting things that I think that we're doing is the creation of what are called artificial floating islands. And this is, um, these are basically these um, floating structures that create attachment site for water plants whose roots dangle down in the water, then in turn creating habitat for microorganisms, beneficial microorganisms that can help to break down water-based pollutants flowing through the water, while the plants themselves can uptake excess nitrogen and phosphorus, which was what causes the eutrophication, the over-fertilization of waterways in the first place, and transforming that into a harvestable biomass that then at the end of the season can be brought ashore and composted. Um, but the really great thing, one of the things I love the most about this is that it's a, it's a participatory activity that can be done with youth. We have the youth in our high school program actually help design and build these systems. And um, it, here's one where we're dragging them down to the, to the Hudson River and actually deploying them in the Hudson River, um, having them rafted to the side of a, of a dock that has a solar panel on it that powered a, an air compressor that bubbles oxygen up into the roots of the floating islands, which is pretty much simulating what's happening in wastewater treatment plant if you ever visit one. They just blast it with oxygen, which stimulates the growth of microorganisms that can help break down sewage. So um, yeah, they can be built cheap, cheaply and, and simply. And another really amazing thing about them, um, you and we actually hauled some in just last weekend is it's just the incredible amount of life that's inside them. We lifted one up and it was just teeming with, with copepods and dragonfly larvae and damselfly larvae and bluegills. And it is the, it's those zooplankton 
this is actually one that we built in the, the um, Gowanus Canal um, a number of years ago too, using uh, saltwater marsh plants. Um, the zooplankton actually consume a lot of the uh, microorganisms, a lot of the algae that contribute to producing what are called harmful algal blooms, which is a, is it not particularly well understood problem affecting lakes and waterways uh, with increasing frequency in, in the region. So um, soil is another really important sphere to discuss. Um, you know, when we think about soils in the city, when we think about barriers to growing food in the city, access to land is a huge one. But second to the fact is the fact that um, urban soils tend to be non-existent or degraded or contaminated, right? So non-existent, meaning they've been paved over, um, degraded. So even if you rip up asphalt, the soil that's underneath has an absorptive capacity slightly better than soil. It's been it's been compacted, it's been starved of moisture, it's been starved of life for decades as a consequence of trucks driving across it over and over again, flattening it. So a lot of work needs to be done to actually put the life back into it and then contaminate it as a consequence of industry being located inside of cities for the past 150 years that we're dealing with the legacy of a lot of those pollutants, particularly lead, which um, Brandon and Kathy uh, mentioned earlier, and they're doing a lot of fantastic work about that uh, up in Troy, which is a fairly ubiquitous urban contaminant resulting from lead-based paint, lead-based gasoline, uh, depending on the city, smelting, that in, you know, in high concentrations can definitely impact people's health, particularly children. So um, we do a fair amount of work around this. One of, um, so we actually, uh, we recently received uh, the same grant that the sanctuary did, which was the DC's um, environmental justice classroom grant. Um, I'm actually in that classroom right now that we were, uh, just completed this past summer. We just had a ribbon cutting. But as part of that, we were also able to purchase uh, something called an XRF, X-ray fluorescence machine that um, basically allows us to test up and down the periodic table. And what we do is we um, host public events, but just sort of have a really kind of an ongoing uh, drop-off program where residents can bring in samples of soil from the backyard and have it screened for lead for free. And this machine is particularly accurate. Um, Kathy and Branda mentioned the importance of coming up with affordable and accurate DIY testing, which is um, unfortunately is, is just a niche that doesn't exist right now, but we need to do a lot more research in that area. These XRF machines, it's, it's, it's a $50,000 machine. I mean, they're incredibly expensive, but however, they can be used as a community tool. And it's one less barrier to having information about what's in the soil, because otherwise you're shipping off soil samples to Cornell or UMass, which and paying a twenty-five dollar fee for analysis, which um you know is 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 not is not is not terrible, but you know for under-resourced communities that's an additional barrier. And again, just be able to bring it over. And we approach it from a very pro-gardening angle. I should mention, right, that even if we detect blood levels uh, of concern in soil, it doesn't mean you can't garden there, right? It's what are some precautions that you can take to do it more safely. Um. Another important thing that, that we research a lot is the idea of community-based fire remediation, basically partnering with naturally occurring organisms such as fungi to remediate contaminants in the soil. I'm a big advocate of actually using spent mushroom compost, growing oyster mushrooms um, on urban waste products like coffee grounds and cardboard, and using the leftover substrate, the stuff that's left behind that is actually rich in enzymes produced by the fungi that can be spread across contaminated soil and the rains will wash those enzymes into the soil where they can facilitate the breakdown of organic pollutants in the soil. So not metals, right? Because they're elemental, they're not gonna be breaking down any further, but things like oil spills or pHs, volatile organic compounds, uh, things of a molecular nature that can be broken down into more innocuous subcomponents. And when that can be hinged with an economic engine and providing jobs for people, that's um, a really great thing. Um, what what time should we switch to Q and A? Uh, can you let me know? Just trying to keep my eye on the time. Yeah, we have until twelve fifteen altogether for your okay. presentation. And if we don't get to Q and A here, we will also be having a group discussion later this afternoon, starting at three. Okay, great. Thank you. So it's up to uh, you. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Um, we've done this work. This is actually a photo from New Orleans uh, around two thousand five, where. We were on the ground post Katrina to develop a protocol for community based fire remediation uh, to deal with the residual contaminants left behind by the storm. I mean, in this case, there's millions of gallons of this toxic combination of sewage and, and oil 
And um, the method that we were using down there was brewing a, a, a product called compost tea, which is basically a liquid culture of beneficial microorganisms, chiefly bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, um, that's produced by taking a handful of worm compost, which is incredibly rich and diverse in microbes itself. Um, really, I mean, healthy, health, a teaspoon of healthy soil contains billions of microorganisms. And when you put them in a liquid culture and provide them with oxygen, uh, which they, uh, the primary uh, limiting factor to microbial metabolism as a whole, and a food source, which in this case is um, molasses, in aerated for 24 hours, you produce this microbial rich liquid that can be sprayed broadly across an area and facilitate the breakdown of pollutants on the ground. And this, of course, is a need that's going to be growing as climate related disasters occur with greater frequency. And in, in all these scenarios, whether it was in New Orleans or whether it was at Hurricane Sandy, you see this toxic residue of sewage and hydrocarbons. And it's interesting that in a lot of those instances, professional air engineering firms are brought in to remediate them. And they are using essentially the same thing. It's typically made of a proprietary blend of a handful of microorganisms, um, but basically a liquid culture of bacteria that is sprayed. Um, compost tea will basically do the same thing, right? We don't have access to the sterile laboratories that would let us identify the heavy lifters that they may be using, but it is reasonable to assume that out of the billions of microorganisms that are in a palm full of worm compost, that ones with the capability of degrading hydrocarbons are going to be present, which is believed to be a, a property of roughly 20% of soil microorganisms to begin with, right? To accelerate that rate of degradation. Um, and it may not be as effective per se um, as proprietary methods used by engineers, but however, when you consider the fact that it can be produced basically at low or no cost and allows community members to partner with biological allies that they already have relationships with, its potential for broad scale application is uh, infinitely greater than relying upon the professional services of environmental engineers who environmental justice communities would never be able to afford the services of. So um, yeah, composting is another big field and exploring this idea of, of compost justice. What, what, what does it mean to apply questions of equity and fairness and justice to composting? Um, so, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of attention being paid to composting right now because people are making the linkages between it and climate change, right? That when, you know, at least in Albany, 20% of the volume of material going into landfill is organic matter. When that's breaking down anaerobically, it's turning into methane, which is 20 to 30 times more potent pound per pound as a greenhouse trapping gas than carbon dioxide. We need to be intercepting that material and composting it aerobically on the surface of the planet and turning it into soil to grow nutrient dense food to feed communities in insecure food insecure neighborhoods. Um, also, bringing it back to contamination, one of the best things that we can do in the instance of lead contamination is to apply compost because A, it's creating physical barriers separating people from contaminated soil below. It's preventing it from becoming dust borne and settling on the surface of vegetables, which is probably our biggest route of exposure. And thirdly, um, uh, lead is lipophilic. It binds with fatty structures, which includes the compounds within compost. So lead essentially can get bound up within the molecular structure of compost and reduce what's called its biological availability. So even if it is accidentally ingested, it's more apt to pass through your body than sticking to receptor sites in the brain where it causes neurological development issues, particularly in children. Um, so yeah, who composts? Who has access to compost? What are the benefits of composting? There are so many benefits to compost and composting for environmental justice communities, not only in terms of job creation, right? But uh, remediating soil, like I just mentioned, for growing nutrient dense food, in, in, in food desert, food apartheid neighborhoods, which Albany is a classic instance of. We have an abundance of liquor stores and, and corner stores, but very little in terms of fresh, affordable, and culturally appropriate food. So um, yeah, this is, is a big conversation because a lot of municipalities are really making a push for centralized, uh, mega scale and highly centralized organics recycling systems. Um, 
you know, it actually having showing a strong preference for anaerobic digestion uh, in highly centralized facilities, which um, are technologically sophisticated systems that are going to depend upon uh, a handful of skilled experts to maintain and that are producing essentially natural gas as a byproduct that being pumped into the existing grid uh, that's revenue generating, that's very attractive to them. But I think, you know, even, even activists, we get caught in this trap where we tend to fetishize um, vertical scaling and um, always thinking big in terms of scaling up and scaling centralized rather than horizontally distributed and decentralized systems, which I am a huge advocate of. So um, let's take a look at this um, pyramid right here, which is developed by the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Um, if you ever get the time, compare this to a very similar pyramid that has been developed by the EPA. And there are some notable differences between the two. They start off the same where the most preferred uses for food waste are source reduction and edible food rescue. But that's where it differs. On the EPA pyramid, you'll see anaerobic digestion, which is um, you know down here at the bottom, uh, right below edible food rescue. So the Institute for Local Self Reliance really inverts that and preferences home scale composting and small scale decentralized composting over centralized composting and anaerobic digestion. So I really want to make sure that environmental justice communities are able to control that niche of small scale residential food waste composting and that you don't have the titans of trash as they're called such as Casella or, or BFI or, or, or WM coming in and basically snatching up all of those contracts and that market and taking that resource away from communities particularly when there's so much potential to use it to regenerate damaged integrated vacant lots I mean I think actually that's an excellent way to repurpose a vacant lot is to use it as a small scale composting facility because you're basically building soil in situ. And after you've completed, you can just open up your compost bin and spread the compost about and create a whole another layer of soil. We've been doing this. We um, actually have a community composting initiative that is now the city of Albany has come around full circle to fully embrace composting. Just 10 years ago, they were philosophically opposed to it. They were of the belief that organic matter should go in the landfill because they had just invented, invested in a methane recovery system and they wanted to feed it. And that was additional revenue for them. Um, yeah, no, really awful. So um, they've, we've kind of dragged them kicking and screaming now into, um, well, we have a contract with the city of Albany to do composting education for residents and to actually um, sponsor a, a community scale composting initiative where we're um, providing residents with free backyard composters. And we're one of two drop off sites where residents can drop off food scraps for free. Uh, that mostly get fed to our chickens or composted. And we also have a um, basically curbside collection service where we're going out with electric cargo bicycles and tricycles and picking up food scraps curbside and creating jobs for um, youth and for other adults in part of our program. One that thing that's really cool about using electric cargos, uh, tricycles and bicycles is that legally they're bicycles. So they don't need to be permitted, insurance, insured, plated, and the riders don't need to be licensed themselves for a lot of potential to create jobs for people who would otherwise be unable to get a driver's license. And also really leading the way as far as electric freight, right? That um, electric cars are still very expensive and there's not really even commercially available electric trucks at this point, but what electric bicycles are, are affordable EVs. Um, and so just, just trying to, to lead the way on that, particularly in, environmental justice communities where I mentioned you have people suffering from a high range of respiratory ailments that are exacerbated by exposure to particulate emissions from diesel trucks and buses. So um, I think bikes and trikes are a good way to um, lead the charge on that. Um, here are some of our chickens at work in eating the food waste to uh, do a fantastic job of just reducing the volume of it and upcycling those nutrients into eggs and a, a key part of our educational system as well. Um, I'm going to just sort of move quickly through some slides here. One thing I wanted to touch on real quickly is um, the importance of tree planting, which, um, you know, there's been a lot of interesting studies in just the past year that are showing the relationships between 
formerly red line neighborhoods and percentage of tree cover. And it, it may come as no surprise that formerly red line neighborhoods have a relative lack of tree cover. Um, this translates to significant differences in temperature between one neighborhood to, to the next that often uh, overlays with income. That low income neighborhoods may be as much as four degrees warmer than neighborhoods with high percentage of tree covers. And this is just compounded by the urban heat island effect, which is just going to accelerate as climate change advances. And on top of that, the fact that low income residents are less likely to be able to afford air conditioning or to even be able to get out of the city in the middle of the summer, contributing hugely to heat related illness during the summer months. Uh, so um, yeah, we've launched uh, this, uh, the South End Biocultural Diversity Forest program where um, we've actually we've gotten funding from um, Community Block Development Grant and from the DEC's uh, Community uh, and Urban Forestry Program where we're going to be planting 150 trees in the South End community, a formerly red line neighborhood at no cost to residents, which is markedly different from the city's program that still requires a 50% partnership. And in under-resourced communities, even that 50% of the cost of purchasing the tree and planting it is a barrier. So engaging with neighbors and talking about the benefits of trees and, and, and planting them. Um, and we're, if anybody's local, November 13th, we actually do need a lot of volunteers to help us. We're gonna get 50 trees in the ground then, and then 50 trees following April, and then 50 trees the fall following after that. And hopefully this will be a project that is ongoing. So, you know, benefits in terms of producing shade and reducing temperature, benefits in terms of air purification, particularly around as apprentice homes, like I mentioned, to block airborne particulates, uh, carbon sequestration, biodiversity enhancement. And another really important component of this that's frequently overlooked when planning urban forestry is the potential for food production. Um, most municipalities are very much opposed to the idea of planting fruit trees because, well, they're always like, well, it makes a mess and then it attracts bees. Um, it's, it's mostly an aesthetic issue. I'm like, okay, well, we have a food access issue in this community, so which is more important. Um, so we are looking at um, ideally uh, primarily native trees that are also food bearing. Um, not necessarily peaches and plums, which could get a little messy, maybe we'll work way off to that, but in the, in the short term, service berries, hawthorns, mountain ash, uh, black walnut, um, butternut, uh, American persimmons, paw, pawpaws, uh, that you know will provide all those benefits, but can also be providing food to residents as well. And one of the programs that that Radix does during its uh, pandemic uh, resilience and, and climate justice youth program is to go out and be harvesting a lot of those uh, fruits and nuts, especially if they're higher up, and then putting that available for for anyone to take. The other component of this is really important is um, to maintain genetic diversity that a lot of urban forests consist completely of clonal varieties. The 100% DNA match between them. City of Worcester, Massachusetts, about 50% of the trees there are all clones of a single red maple. That means if the disease comes through, it's just gonna wipe it out. So trying to grow trees from seed, which is a multi-generational effort, but you can see some photos in the beginnings of our community nursery here, where we're trying to create genetically unique individuals of a wide variety of species to improve the the genetic resilience of the urban forest, which is going to be stressed increasingly as climate change advances. Um, urban biocultural diversity. I only have a matter of minutes left, so I'm just gonna quickly fly through these, but um, this is not a way to try and link concerns around equity and justice uh, with biodiversity conservation, which traditionally are two fields that are quite separate. Most biodiversity conservation is led by affluent white people and, um, is, is often dismissive or disdainful of concerns around justice and equity. So we're really trying to bridge those two together and demonstrate how what's good for humans is good for birds and bees and what's good for birds and bees is also in turn good for humans. To make the linkages very clear between biodiversity conservation and human health and societal well-being. A um, couple examples I wanna show here really quickly. Um, one of the projects that we actually do uh, during the winter month is uh, maple syruping in the city of Albany, where we have a permit from the city to be collecting sap from maple trees that then gets boiled down with the youth back at the Radix Center and turned into maple syrup. And, um, you know, one of the coolest, I mean, A, it's a great thing to do during the winter months when there's really not that much else going on, but also just a way to create a reciprocal relationship 
between youth and the forest in the city. And I really try and push that, that ethic of reciprocity, right? So, because a lot of conventional environmental education takes this very much this, this don't touch approach, right? Like the environment is just something you stand in front of and you feel anxious about. And that contributes a lot to eco-anxiety and eco-trauma. The other side of that is just take whatever you want and lay it all to waste. We don't want to promote that either, right? But an ethic of reciprocity, the emphasis is on showing interconnection, right? That you're going to be far more motivated to work in the defense or the protection of something if you know your own survival or your own well-being is inherently interconnected with it. So I think Maple Sap and Maple Serving is a great way to illustrate that, along with quite a number of, of other things. Um, there's a being boiled down. So anyway, yeah, if you're interested to review, co review copies of my book, please send me an email. I'd be happy to share it with you. Um, and I'm gonna quit there and see if um, anybody has any questions with the little bit of time we have left. Thank you. Really lovely, really rich. I mean, like so much there. What can we say? <laughs> Whoa, thank you. That is That is just, you know, a million ideas in one. Thank you for all of your good work. I mean, we really do look to you as like our, you know, our sister lab here between Nature Lab and, and Radix and you just are always on the leading edge of, of a lot of these ideas. So thank you for all of that, Scott. Really great. You're welcome. I always think of you almost as like an external hard drive, right? At least in a genetic sense, right? <laughs> that if we were have, uh, you know, I mean, even chickens, we had some chickens from your place come order to our place and you no, know, if if our yeah. um, I don't know if our uh, we lost our seeds, we could always rely on you as a backup, right? <laughs> a lot of reciprocity and sharing. That'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, I, one question that came up earlier on in the chat, which was when you were talking about the floating islands, people were asking about how you it, it could could those potentially be used to combat things like algae blooms? I know you're working with them on the river. But um, I, that's a really great question. I was just curious what your thoughts were about that. Yeah, and, and, and that, that is one of the emerging greatest benefits of it. In addition to just complexifying and diversifying, I mean, in the case of Albany, pretty much a concrete bulkhead that's utterly sterile, right, is that you're creating habitat for zooplankton. And what they're finding is that it's the zooplankton that are eating the microalgae that contribute to what are called HABs or harmful algal blooms. So that is probably one of the biggest benefits of them is their ability to um, reduce the frequency and likelihood of harmful algal blooms that make connection with waterways dangerous. Awesome. So we should all be building these incredibly fun. We've done we've done one with you, and it was incredibly fun to do. So <laughs> I encourage everybody to build their own floating islands, and and um, so that would be great. Other questions? Um, put them in the chat, please. And um, uh, I'm just trying to look. Here, one one thing I one question I had was, and I think you are doing this, but I really love the tree planting program that you're developing, and kudos on getting that funding and getting that going. It's going to be really important. Um, I know, so, like thinking about uh, permaculturalists like Oliver Kelhammer is uh, has done work where he's been planting trees in um, places that maybe are uh, too they wouldn't survive in such a northern climate, but because of climate change, they're beginning to, you know, actually take off. Is this yeah. something that you're considering with this biodiversity that you're you're looking at for the forest? I know that you mentioned that. Yeah, you know, even even at Radix, I've got a couple of what I call my climate change indicator plants. Um, plants that are kind of like maybe zone seven plants. We're like a zone six, if any of you are familiar with that, uh, the USDA zone system. Um, ones that are, you know, slightly outside of our zone that typically wouldn't survive here. Um, for instance, I have a pomegranate, which, um, you know, a little bit south of here, those would survive outdoors. And it's a tree that will die back to the ground every winter, but come up from the roots. It does, it's not cold enough to kill the roots. And there's going to be a year where, um, where it doesn't die back to the ground. That's not going to be a good year, right? This is a very small silver lining to climate change and not something that we're happy about all in all. However, right, we have, it, it's an aspect of, of adaptation, right? That we want trees that are going to be able to survive in a warmer climate. That's an important aspect of resilience building. So that's an example of that. Another 
is um, the ultra northern pecan, which um, the pecan trees people very much associated as a southern species, but there are northern varieties that will even grow as far north as in Illinois. Um, you know, with a lot of those trees, it's it's like the tree will actually survive. It just is too cold for it to actually bear nuts. But I've got some of those I'm going to be planting because I'm thinking, well, it's going to be several decades before they bear nuts anyway. Um, by that point, climate change should take care of that. Um, again, not happy about that at all, but it's it's a way to be like, well, looking long term into the future, right? Decades, decades beyond our own lifetimes, which is is really liberating to think about in that way, right? It's, it's not about me, right? It's about those yet to come. Awesome. Um, Brando, do you want to jump in with any questions? Because we only have a couple minutes left. Well, that's just a really great segue from what you just said, Scott. Uh, you, you, it's really amazing beyond your deep knowledge um, at Radix of science and of um, uh, uh, urban gardening your relationship with the local community, with the local youth, with the generations to come. Can you talk just to end out this uh, amazing session with how critical that is to embed all of that knowledge and pass it on um, uh, to the hyper-local space uh, where you are situated in the urban landscape and how to pass that on as far as uh, leadership and stewardship skills. How important yeah. is that in growing? I mean, it's, it's everything. It's, it's, it's everything to be training the next generation. I mean, that's pretty much what I see our educational programs is doing is creating a pipeline of the environmental educators of the future, right? Who are going to have a deep connection with these systems and, and, and love, right? You know, I mean, taking a page from the concept of ecophobia of cultivating in some ways love before knowledge, right? That I think part of what causes so much to eco-anxiety and eco-trauma in youth is that they're just bombarded with fear and bad news all the time. And, and, that, and, that, and that's real, that fear and that bad news is, is real and we need to engage with it. But we need to give youth a chance to just build a sense of connection and love and concern with the non-human because ultimately they're going to be so much more motivated to work in the defense of something that they love rather than just doing it out of a sense of fear or obligation. So, you know, starting, I mean, I'm an advocate of, of education at every level, adults, adult education is incredibly important, but youth, but particularly children, right? When they're young, when their hearts and minds are just open and they're just soaking up, making connections um, every day. Um, so yeah, it's really about creating the next generation and thinking beyond myself in my own lifetime. <laughs>